Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're calling from. Uh, just before I started, I wanted to share that this is a multilingual event um, in both English and French. So if you need translation, there's a little button at the bottom of the um, screen that says translation or interpretation. Um, and I also wanted to flag that this is a recorded event so that it can live on our website afterwards. And all questions about this roundtable discussion should be submitted via chat. Um, so firstly, thank you all for joining this roundtable event. And just before I pass to our moderator, Anne-Marie, I just will give a brief background on our work. Um, for those of you who may not know me, my name is Veronica Chatelain, and along with my colleague uh, who's on this call, Dr. Ibrahim Anyang, we lead Open Society uh, Foundation's Global Initiative for the Restitution of African Cultural Heritage. Our hopes for, for not just this roundtable, but for future ones is that it will serve as a knowledge sharing platform and will create a space where African cultural heritage is not just celebrated, but is also um, calls for the restitution of both tangible and intangible heritages that were looted from Africa during colonialism. Um, so right before I pass to Anne-Marie, um, I would just firstly like to thank the panelists in advance as well as our communications team. Thank you, Donald, thank you, Eric, um, who worked very diligently to pull all this together for us. Um, our interpreter, Sosten, and lastly, our moderator, who I'm also now gonna introduce, Anne-Marie Bethune, who is an author, um, Cameroonian descent, and is our comms officer for Open Society Africa. Thank you. Um, Anne-Marie, it's all yours. You're muted, Anne-Marie. <laughs> Hello everyone, I am Anne-Marie, um, just as Veronica just said. Thank you everyone um, for being here with us today. I hope you are all doing well. I'm very happy and very honored to be here today to talk about the very first um, restitution of cultural heritage in Cameroon. Ngonso is coming back home. Ngonso is the only uh, spiritual and physical um, sorry, it's the only spiritual and physical representation of the founder of the Nso people. He is a connection to the ancestors to invoke peace, unity, and fertility. Today, we are here with the people behind um, the return of Ngonso in Cameroon after 120 years in Germany, exhibited in a museum. So we are here today with Sylvie Njobati, who is a cultural um, activist. She's the person behind all of this. She's um, the founder and executive director of um, CC House of Fame, the organization behind um, the campaign Bring Back Ngonso. We are also here with Bilam, Bulami Edward, who is um, from the Nso tribe. He's very invested in the cultural life of his uh, community. He's a writer, a researcher, and a cultural anthropologist. He's among the people behind the Ngonso Cultural Festival. He's here with us today, but he, um, his video is off. He will join us with, uh, during the Q&A session. We are also here with Maria Perez Ramirez, who is an associate researcher for the German Contact Point. Um, she will share with us the work of her organization. Thank you. Now I will, I, will, I will give the floor to Sylvie to share with us her work. Thank you very much, Anne-Marie. A big thank you to everyone who has joined us today. I'm very excited to be here today to talk about the Bring Back Gonzo campaign, how far it has gone, where we are today, and what are the plans for the future, and also to talk about other objects, the royal objects that are present in the Linden Museum. So I will start by giving a brief introduction of myself. I know you've already heard that. My name is Jobati Silvi Vernier, and I'm the founder of CC House of Fame. So CC House of Fame is an organization that is harnessing the potential of arts and culture in order to promote peaceful and prosperous community. As CCI House of Fame, we, we have a project that is ongoing and it's called Colonial Dialogue and Reconciliation. And right now, this project is focusing on restitution. I am also the team lead for the Bring Back Gonzo campaign. And we've been working on this campaign since 2018 to ensure that 
Ngonso and other royal objects in Germany return to sort people in Cameroon. So the quest to get Bang Gonso started as a personal journey for me to dismantle the multiple layers of identity crisis that I was going through as an individual. And I think it's important to share a brief background of this journey. So I, I grew up with my grandfather and he was a pastor, a reverend pastor with the Presbyterian church, but also at the same time, he was supposed to be a traditional ruler. And so he felt that um, he, he couldn't serve two masters at once, especially as one had been made to be darkness and the other light. So it was very, very difficult for him to take the choice of being a traditional ruler. So I spent time with him in the Northwest region of Cameroon, which is the Anglophone part of Cameroon, where I moved from one church to another, supporting him with the worship. And so I grew up totally disconnected from my tradition and culture. I didn't know who I was. I mean, all I knew is that I was a child of God. And would that be sufficient later on to help me unravel the mysteries around my identity? This is a question we'll find out later in this presentation. And I want us to fast forward to like 10 years later when I was already around 17 years old. I had just moved from the Anglophone region, was living in Bamenda then, to Yaoundé, the French region. And I must say that I have never had a cultural shock in my life, even you know, traveling from one country to another as I had only moving from one region to the other within my own country. And to summarize, me just like everyone else from the Anglophone region was, and I think is still treated as a second class citizen. And this is simply because of where we come from. I mean, we are considered the minority. So we were not judged and treated, or we are not judged and treated by, from where we come from as soft people, as bafood, as batibo. But now we are a minority only because the yardstick for measurement is colonial boundaries drawn by Britain and France. We are only a minority because we are defined by the English system of education that we inherited from colonialism or the French system of law that we inherited still during the same time. And so at that point in my life, you know, it, it, it was a bit difficult for me I couldn't, I didn't know who I was, you know, the, the word Anglophone rapidly became Anglophone, like an insult for Anglophones. But Manda, where I come from, which is in the English um, region of Cameroon as well, gradually became a cliche for the unwanted people in, in the community. And so this was quite difficult for me. I became an enraged young woman. I looked at myself in the mirror and I asked, who the hell are you? I couldn't recognize myself anymore. So I started asking critical questions like, who am I when the bustle of the day goes down and I lay alone in my bed? I started asking, who am I when all the colonial liabilities are stripped of me? And now fast forward again to when I'm 25 years old and in 2016. And you know, by this time I was pregnant and uh, for, for some reason, we were not sure how I'd be treated in hospitals where I was because my French is not the impeccable France French. So I moved back to Bamenda and immediately I, the armed conflict started. And I realized that this armed conflict was also decrying the same things that had put a question mark on my identity. So it was a bit, at this time I knew that for me, I had to go back to my roots. I needed to connect to understand who I am before colonialism, to understand who I am as a person without any colonial attachment. And so I went back to my grandfather. I, my grandfather has played a very key role in my life. And we had a very life-changing conversation. And he looked at me and told me, all these things you're trying to get, all the answers you're trying to get right now, history and ancestry has the answers to this. That is a powerful tool you have to understanding who you are. And 
in this conversation again, he talked about Ngonso. In, in, when we started talking about Ngonso, I, I saw how his countenance changed. He was more calm and you know, more emotional, more solemn. And the last thing he told me was that he would like to sing Gonzo before he passes on, before he goes to eternity, like he put it, like I'll put it in his own words. And there I then I knew that it was time to ensure the return of Gonzo. So at this point in time for me, there was no question, there was no doubt about the importance of Gonzo. And I think it's important for us also to understand the object we are talking about. So the statue of Ngonso is a beautifully wooden bowl bearer figure. So she's carefully covered with cowries, royal cowries, and her features are really outstanding. So you, when you see the object, you really see that her eyes and her mouth that pop out so well, that pop out so gracefully. And so when you see this object, and I, and I put object in quote because we never call even if it's a statue, we always refer it to Ngonso and we refer it to she, to her. So when you look at this statue, you see a mother, you see a reflection of a leader, you see a unifier, you see a symbol of peace as Anne-Marie already said. So to us, she's the embodiment of our history and ancestry. And so it's difficult for us to comprehend why we would be disconnected from who we are from our essence of existence. And I think also it's important to understand the context in which she was taken and who she is as Ngonso, the person and not the object. So Ngonso found and saw after separating from her brothers in a succession dispute. And despite the insurgencies from the different militant groups that attacked the land that where she settled in first, she resisted, she fought for her people, she changed settlement, but always she moved with her people and she unified them. And many years after her passing, the statue of Ngonso was now made in her honor. And from fawn to fawn, the statue was used for rituals in the land to invoke fertility, peace and prosperity. It was used as a link to connect and commune with our ancestors. And like you must have read or heard before, so people, their, their traditional setups are powerfully built within their ancestry. And so in 1902, during uh, Germany's catastrophic encounter with the so people that saw murders, torture, arson and looting, our beloved mother, and many other royal objects were taken under unsolicited circumstances, which is clearly the circumstances were violent. And at that point, they existed unequal power relations. And then sometimes in the 70s, a renowned native from so Professor Kishani Tanlaka, was in Germany for a study program and then spotted Ngonso in Berlin while on the study program and raised an alarm. And since then, the struggle has been on to get her back. Now, some efforts can no longer be traced. We can no longer have proper documentation of certain efforts, but we have letters dating as far back as 1998. But again, between 1998 and 2011, we've had a couple of requests back and forth to Germany, but the, the, the feedback had always been negative. We would have ridiculous feedback like um, the object is legally ours. We will hear things like, okay, we can give it to you on loan. And then when you use it, you can give it back to us. And so for me in 2018, I had an understanding of the importance of the object. I had a full mastery of my journey, but also it was important for me to start to understand this object, where it had been, where it is, what has been done. And in 2018, I started by working on a research to you know, have a full understanding again of this object, meeting with different stakeholders and having different presentations and talking to people on the Cameroon side about the Ngonso. And what I had learned from my previous uh, reflections during the past processes is that 
first of all, some people had been sending letters to unknown. So these conversations were happening behind closed doors. And I mean, no one was under pressure to make anything happen. Also, in so now in 2021, CCI House of Fame's board actually voted to say this is an important subject and we want to make it priority. And by May, we had launched an intensive social media campaign. And like I always tell people that uh, the social media campaign has played a very key role to the success of, 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 of uh, Return from Gonzo. So just a few weeks after launching this campaign, we had gained traction on the internet and supporters as well. We were then connected to the German contact point for collections in colonial context. Um, and days later, we were in a meeting with Maria, who is here with us today, and also other colleagues of ours, with whom we had a very good conversation. And through this conversation, we were able to have a full understanding of what it might take for us to make the restitution request, whom we have to talk to, and how we have to talk to, what are the right channels, and who are the appropriate persons to send in a restitution request. So while following these other channels, we now amplified our, con our advocacy and campaigns. We connected with civil society, both in Germany and in Cameroon, who supported very, very powerfully. By September, um, September was a very important moment in this conversation as well, because for not the first time, but for the first time in a long time, then Gonzo was going to be on display to the public. And this is something for us and some people. This is sacrilege. This is a taboo. This is not accepted at all. And by then I was in Congo, Brazzaville. So I flew to Germany to protest in front of the Humboldt Forum with other supporters and some people against the display and the viewing of Gonzo. And there we established contacts also with the museum and I got to meet uh, Professor Dr. Herman Patzinger. And we had these conversations. And already by the 10th of December, we were having a workshop. And basically, the purpose of this workshop was for us to support the, the German stakeholders to deepen their understanding of what Ngonsort means to us and what the return would mean to us. So it was also an opportunity, for, an opportunity for us to make our case very powerfully. And in that presentation, Bulami, who is here with us today, did an, a powerful presentation. And this marked a turning point in the campaign, because at this point in time, instead of putting up a defensive front saying the Gonzo is legally our property, or we would want to give it to you as a loan, the position of the museum dramatically changed, surprisingly to some people. They now issued a statement acknowledging that the circumstances under which Ngonso was acquired, that the circumstances were violent, and definitely there was like the unequal power relation dynamics, and therefore they would be willing to work with us to find a possible solution. You know, always it was always about a possible solution, not really restitution. And so at the back of my mind, I was like, okay, I would, we would sit together as a team and we reflect what could be the other solution apart from restitution. And then we develop messages around this again. And by March, we were approached again by the museum to compile the results of the workshop, which we shared with them. And by June, we had a decision for restitution. And I must say that this has been um, a tremendous win for us as people, for Cameroon as a whole, for Africa as a whole, and for every other community out there that is seeking restitution or return of their objects that were collected in colonial context. The next steps. Now it requires that Cameroon stakeholders organize themselves and meet with the German team for negotiations first, transfer, and then the return process proper. And this is what we as CCS of Fame, we are also doing, we are supporting the SOC community to be able to get together, brainstorm, and answer critical questions that are still pending when it comes to the question of the return of Gonzo. And we are also supporting the government. So we are trying to create a connection 
and to harmonize efforts and activities, not only for the case of Ngonso, but for other restitution cases as well here in Cameroon. And always, I always like to share the lessons learned because I think when we build on the lessons learned, we can always um, continue to work powerfully to ensure that other objects come back. And consistency for me is the first lesson that I learned that it is very, very important to stay consistent, to keep sending in the same message over and over through the different chosen platforms. I, I always say, do not miss a chance to preach the gospel of restitution. That's what I always say. So I guess it's something that for me, I find very important because when you start the campaign like this, there are always uh, distractions from different directions. You would you might want to give up the moment you started or before even starting it, but it is important to be consistent because while you're campaigning to ensure that restitution happens, there are also anti-restitutivists, people who don't even want it to happen. So it's a competition. Also, I think it's very important to know from what standpoint you are making a restitution request. Is it from a right-based approach using you know, human and cultural rights angle? to amplify your case or is it evidence-based approach to say okay we have this evidence and it's clear and we demand so in fact it's, it's important to have a mastery of the whole conversation of the colonial past and for me one of the most important things that I've come to understand is the power of me and you on this call today I mean who was I when I started this campaign civil society, grassroots movements and individuals made this happen. We have the power to shape conversations. We may not be able to make the decisions ourselves, but we have all it takes to push the people that are in position to make power, to make the decisions for the change we want. That's something I have learned and that has actually changed my whole being and how I'm able to support other people as well. And now the, the conversation has built very powerfully the momentum has been built and this is the time to take the opportunity to make restitution request it's also for me it's also a time for all stakeholders to get together to reflect on how to facilitate restitution and not wait for people to rain hailstones or brainstorms on people before restitution happens and we we build on the new media and in the months ahead we will be having Ngonso back and it's worth mentioning that um, Ngonso was looted as part of a royal collection that is always in the palace and play complement all these objects that play a complementary role to each other so when isolated these objects might not be able to play the same or to perform the same function as the deed. And the rest of these objects are in Stuttgart, Linden Museum. And we are also requesting for the return of these objects. We've been in conversation with, with the museum, I think since November last year. And our honest wish had been that we work out a solution to ensure that as Ngonso is coming back, all these objects come back together with Ngonso because like I mentioned, these are a collection, a royal collection, those objects that make the throne, the sort of throne what it is and that makes us who we are. And I have my colleague here with me, Mr. Bulami Edward, who has a second part of this presentation that is focusing on the royal objects that are now in the Linden Museum. So I don't know, Anne-Marie, I don't know how, how it would work best for you, please. Um, Kindly advice. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I will give the floor to Maria first because uh, Edward okay. is supposed to join us for the Q and A. But before I give the floor to Maria, I have a question for you. Yes, it is very amazing that um, the, the the return of Ngonsto started with uh, an individual quest. Yes, almost a hundred years after it 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 left. Actually, more than a hundred years after after it left the country. One hundred twenty. Yes. Yes. So. So for you to know about your roots, you turn to your grandfather who knew about the history of the people, of the so people. So my question now is, how about young people? Are they aware of 
of uh, the importance of Ngonso for the Nso people. Um, what were the challenges to, 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 to get them on board? Do they yeah. really understand what is happening and are they ready to take care of Ngonso? Yes, uh, thank you for that question. I think it's a very important question. Uh, one of the things that we, we tried to do during this campaign was to create that link between uh, that generational link to ensure that conversations are sustainable and to also ensure that as young people, they should be able to understand the depth of the conversation right from identity issues and not just objects that are returning. At the beginning, it was quite difficult. So, you know, you would approach someone and they would tell you, okay, we have this armed conflict going on. People don't have food to eat. Why should we worry about an object? But when we started breaking it down to them that this is not about an object, one thing, one example I gave in a conference that I was a speaker in, I, I said, assume now that you don't speak English. Assume now that there is no English system of education. There is no French law to judge you. Who are you? That was a question I asked. Who are you? Strip off all the colonial liabilities you have on you. Who exactly are you? Are you able to tell me who you are? If you are not, then you are beginning to understand why we are having these conversations. And along the line, young people started joining powerfully. They started, you know, like I mentioned that it might have been a personal journey, but it's a representation. It's a fair representation of other young people. You started seeing on social media, artists were drawing photos of Ngonso. We had artists making paintings. We had musicians singing about Ngonso. So for me, it was just, it was what was lacking was the awareness. And now that the awareness is there, the young people are so ready. They are already putting themselves together in on, on the different groups and already planning their return. They are not just planning to welcome Ngonso, but they are also planning to reconnect back to Ngonso. My, my, my mic and I are not friends today. Thank you very much for this, Sylvie. Um, now I will give the floor to Maria, who is part of the German contact point. Um, her in institution was very central to the return of Gonzo in Cameroon. So Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Anne-Marie, and thank you very much, Sylvie, also for the invitation to, to this very interesting uh, discussion. Um, and I have to say that uh, I'm, I'm very happy to see how this conversation has moved on and where and, and at which point we are at right now uh, regarding the restitution of Nigonso. I remember when Sylvie contacted us in May last year and we initiated this conversation. And, and for us, this is also, you know, a, a case uh, that evidences now how Germany has also been moving forward regarding the topic of decolonizing uh, and the return of cultural uh, objects from colonial context. As you were mentioning, I'm uh, the coordinator and also a research associate um, at the German contact point uh, for collections from colonial context, an institution that was created in part uh, because uh, there needed to be an acknowledgement of the historical responsibility uh, related or deriving from uh, German colonial rule or German colonialism. Uh, the contact point was created in October 2000 and on the 16th of October 2019 by 19 by the federal government, uh, the Commissioner for Culture and the Media, uh, the Ministers of State of the Federal Foreign Office um, for International Cultural Policy, uh, the Cultural Affairs Ministers of the Lenda and the Lenda senators for cultural affairs and also representatives of the municipality umbrella organizations, which means that this is a project that was created and agreed on by the federal German federal government, the German uh, federal states, and also the, the uh, municipalities, so to say, in Germany. And by doing so, they are implementing a central point of the so-called framework principles for dealing with collections from colonial context which were agreed on in March uh, 2019, the framework principles, which is, you know, like a, our guidelines, our working guidelines. You can find this document in our, in our webpage online. And this document defines six areas of activity and objectives for dealing with collections from colonial context in Germany. And these are transparency and documentation, provenance research, uh, presentation and information, 
return cultural exchange, international cooperation, as well as science and research. Uh, and especially, and that, that concerns so, um, the creation of the contact point uh, regarding the area of activity and objective transparency and documentation. The framework principle states uh, that design in Paris agreed to give people and institutions from the countries and societies of origin, in particular, the possibility to learn about the collections from colonial context held in Germany and to obtain also concrete advice, uh, which, which is, you know, it can be related to, to our cooperation with CLB. Um, also as regard possible returns and, and, and cooperation with, with German institutions and in order to greatly, greatly facilitate and improve access to such information, um, a proposal would be drawn for the establishment and organization of a contact point. The contact point became a reality in August 2020 and it aims in particular at individuals and institutions from the countries and societies of origin it is intended to serve as the first and central uh, point of contact for all questions uh, concerning collections from colonial, Germ colonial context in Germany. And in particular, it will carry, it is supposed to carry out the following uh, tasks, which are, of course, to provide information and advice on collections from colonial context in Germany and related topics. So, for example, uh, a, a person from, from Colombia or a person from Namibia, either a researcher or a person, a representative of a community of origin, contact, uh, contacts us uh, wanting to know where an object uh, or a group of objects might be located. So it's our responsibility with the means and the information that we have to provide this information. We also forward inquiries and requests on a case-to-case -case basis because we are a contact point, as the name says. We are not responsible for what happens uh, uh, at the end with this conversation or the cooperation. So if, if, if for example, um, we realize that a request regards more a process that for which the trustee of a museum is responsible of, we forward this uh, request to the trustees or the cultural ministry uh, that's responsible for a museum or an institution. If, if, a, if a request concerns the cooperation uh, related to provenance research, we work very closely with the German Lost Art Foundation uh, that has, you know, like a, like a, um, also a, an office, so to say, for dealing with collections from colonial context. We also organize and document information uh, and we support the Fer federal government Lenda Working Group on dealing with collections from colonial context in Germany, which is or acts as our uh, steering committee in the elaboration and for the development of the areas of activity and objectives defined in the, in the framework principles. Um, just, you know, as, as, as a clarification of a structure, the cultural foundation of, foundation, sorry, of the German federal states, the, the so-called in German Kulturstiftende Länder serves as an administrative and organizational seat of the German contact point. And we also have a cooperation consortium uh, with the German Lost Star Foundation and the, and the planned agency for international cooperation between museums uh, that is planned and financed by the Federal Foreign Office and also the um, municipalities or the, or the municipal umbrella organization. Uh, organization, sorry, and the contact point is funded in equal parts. That's also maybe relevant by the lender, by the German federal states, and by the federal government. Um, we and, and and maybe this is. Uh, I'll try to summarize this because it's uh, it's a lot of information. I know uh, the first two years, so to say, of the contact point uh, have been focused on on working on on the field or in the field of transparency and documentation. Uh, if you are curious, you can you can consult the, the document, the framework principles. Uh, they state that, of course, the precondition for responsible handling of collections from colonial context and the related processing of history uh, is the greatest possible degree of, of transparency because transparency facilitates lower ownership. And in this context, uh, the framework principles also recognize the importance of conducting inventories and of digitizing collections from colonial context, contexts and proposes ways to support also institutions uh, holding such collections. And uh, within this framework, we are uh, developing now uh, a project, so to say, or implementing 
a document that's called the Three Rules Strategy for the Documentation and Digital Publication of Collections from Colonial Context in Germany. We are implementing this project together with the German Digital Library, that's our main partner. And uh, as, as the, the name says, the, 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 the Three Rules Strategy, you know, uh, a calls for three roads uh, to, to digitize and, and digitally publish uh, information on, on objects from colonial context. Road uh, one is short-term access, uh, which is the creation of a central access to collections from colonial context. A uh, digital platform, a database was already published uh, at the end of November last year. And we have already around uh, 6,600 data sets uh, of objects uh, related to objects from colonial context from 25 institutions, which are like the pilot institutions that are working with us uh, right now uh, within the framework of implementation of the three role strategy. Row two refers to basic digitization and digital publication of unpublished collections from colonial context in a central repository in line with uniform standards. So we are agreeing with this 25 institutions on, on standards for uh, digitizing and, and digitally publishing information on, on collections from colonial context. And uh, we have been working on a data field catalog for this uh, for the publication of this information. And we also have a consultation next week, uh, which I think is, a, is a, the main part of the process. We have a consultation with experts from the communities and societies of origin, because of course we cannot just publish information uh, with standards that were agreed on in, in Europe without considering, of course, the voices of, of, of people in, in uh, communities and societies of origin. We will have colleagues from, from Africa, from uh, the Pacific, from, this, from, from, Oceania, from Oceania, from South America, and we'll discuss this, this data standards, so to say, next week. And row three is, is cooperation with uh, communities and, and societies of origin, as well as the diaspora, which also plays a very important role for the digitization and digital publication of this information. Um, in addition to this three road strategy and also within the framework of, of uh, transparency and documentation, um, we are participating in the implementation of the uh, statement of the handling of the Benin bronzes in German museums and institutions. Uh, you probably saw the news um, maybe a month ago or three, weeks, three or four weeks ago uh, the, the Germany and Nigeria signed a declaration that, that uh, uh, foresees the return of the Benin bronzes that are held in, in German uh, museums and collections and the German contact point uh, within the framework control of transparency published uh, a database of the Benin bronzes that are held in 15 museums and collections in Germany that was done in, on the 15th of June 2021. Uh, and we have we have also published information uh, related to the to the provenance of, of these objects. Um, maybe one one last point, if I if I may, and this concern um, also return or restitution, just to remind you that uh, the framework principles, this uh, this document that I've been mentioning uh, so often during my during my talk. Uh, define or state that identifying cultural objects from colonial context which were appropriated in a way which is no longer legally or ethically justifiable and enabling their return is a moral and ethical obligation and an important political task for our age. Human remains, which is something that we have also been working on uh, lately from colonial context are to be returned and requests for the return of artifacts from colonial context are to be processed promptly. At the same time, cultural heritage institutions are called upon to take an independent and proactive approach to identify artifacts in their collections, which might be returned, even if there has been no request for return, which means that museums should acknowledge also the responsibility. It doesn't have to be the case only that uh, people that have the energy, um, like Silby, to, to deal with this issue, that, that um, there should be you know, a, a, a request for an institution to act, but the, the institution should also proactively deal with this topic, which is what, what some ethnological museums uh, are already doing in, in Germany. There are 
many, you know, I think good cases of, of, of best practices right now in Germany, which which I think is is, is uh, very relevant to mention when one compares the situation with um, different countries in Europe. So I think that was my, my very brief and general introduction and um, I will be very happy to answer your questions later. Thank you. Thank you, Maria, for your presentation. Um, before we go to the Q&A session, uh, please people uh, share your questions in, in the chat box. Um, before we go to the Q&A sessions with Sylvie and uh, Bulami who, who will join us, I have a question for you. Um, most of the time, it is the public authorities of a country who um, demand, let's not say demand, but ask for the return of their cultural, um, I will not say objects because Sylvie said that they are not seen as objects, so I will say property. But in this, in this um, situation, it was a civil society um, initiative that led to the return of Ngonso. So how was it um, received by the German authorities? Were they open? Um, were they ready to listen? How, 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 how did it go? Yes, of course, because our, our responsibility, and I'm, and I'm talking as, as, as myself and, and, and my colleagues at the contact point, is to deal with requests not only from from uh, from countries of origin, from so to say, from the from the government or from governmental represent, representatives of a of a country of origin, but also from from communities and societies of origin or representatives from these communities. So I mean, it's not possible, of course, just to say, okay, we will ignore everything that it's not related to the government. Of course, when a restitution is decided, there needs to there needs to be an agreement between the German and in this case the government in Cameroon that uh, facilitates, so to say, the, the return uh, of, of, of an object, of, a, of an artifact of an ancestor, the, the, the repatriation of an ancestor. There needs to be an agreement, but, but we need, we have to take into account, and that's also a responsibility, and that's also stated in the framework principles that we will deal with requests from representatives of the communities and, and societies of origin. And that means uh, people like, like for example, Sylvie and, and her campaign and also representatives or people from the diaspora uh, in, in Germany, from the African, from the Latin American diaspora in, in Germany. So um, I think that uh, beyond it being well received or not, it's it's more a responsibility than, than, than anything else. Uh, also, because I think, I mean, for, for a government to, to have an overview of what the communities really need and which institution, but which objects they want to, to, to be returned, it's, it's also very difficult. Sometimes they just, they just don't have the overview and it's important to empower the communities also to deal with these issues and, and to, to reclaim their cultural heritage. Okay, um, I have another, another question. Are there prerequisites? for Germany to give back the property to a country? Are there requirements? Beyond, as I mentioned, um, the fact that the, the country and community of origin want, wants the yes, beyond that, yes. and yes. the fact that there should be, of course, an agreement between, between both governments, so to say, uh, there are no requirements because in the end, uh, the community of origin, the country of origin is responsible for, for the cultural heritage, for the human remains, once these have been repatriated or returned. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, there are no requisites for, for, for a restitution process beyond these formal aspects. Okay, thank you. We have a question from Leonor Lamas. Um, how does the German public feel about restitution? Is there support behind it? Would it be easier to put pressure on, mu on museums using a survey? Uh, I think that's a, that's a very, very difficult question because you have many, many voices um, in, in Germany. I would say, I would dare to say that maybe, maybe the younger generations are more aware of this topic and are, are not really fighting hard for this topic. There is also a, a very important movement, movement coming from academia who have been dealing and, and, and studying and researching on these issues for, for quite a long time in Germany. 
and, and who are also important voices uh, in, in, in topics like decolonizing, not only museums, but dealing with, with German colonial past and, and German colonial history. And of course, the diaspora in Germany is, is very strong and, and they are also connected to, to, to civil societies, civil society organizations in Germany who are also dealing with this, with this uh, topic. And regarding the museums, I guess, um, um, beyond, uh, or, or I, I wouldn't say, um, I wouldn't worry about it too much. And the framework principle establish a framework, so to say, and, and uh, the federal government and the German federal states agreed on, on the fact that when an object was unethically or illegally you know, taken to Germany, and in, in these circumstances, the object should be returned. So uh, whether a museum director like it or not, I think it's, it's a responsibility to deal with, this, with these issues. Now that Bulami and Sylvie um, join, uh, joined us, I have a question for them. Um, Ngonso is coming back home. Um, there is this conversation around how the, the, the properties will be, will be taken care of once back home. So in Cameroon, do we have um, the knowledge and the technology to, to, to care for such an important um, property? I know that Bulami was really invested in the post restitution plan. So maybe um, he can throw some light. Bulami, are you there? Uh, thank you, anne -Marie. I'm there. Thank you, uh, other panelists. Yeah, um, I think uh, your question is um, really um, a, a preoccupation with us, but that preoccupation is already being taken care of by the, 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 the Nsor community. Uh, they are very conscious of the fact that Ngonso, first, as a spiritual uh, object, has a special place where it has to be kept when it finally returns. The, 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 uh, the other um, worry could be the preservation of that object for the next 120 years as it, were, uh, it, as it has been preserved, uh, I mean, uh, as, uh, for it has happened for the past 120 years. How are we going to make it happen again for the next 120 years? That should be the worry of the so people, which they are actually uh, considering taking care of. Um, it, it, it won't be the traditional way of taking care of it without actually incorporating the modern so as to make better, I mean, the, the, that the complementarity is being considered where you where the traditional aspect of Gonzo will be there and then the modern aspect of it in terms of preservation. I think there is, uh, there, the so people are work, working towards that and we believe that with uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the restitution, partnerships and all what uh, not that could help the so people keep and preserve Gonzo the way, uh, in, a very, in a modern way, though in a traditional setup, uh, is very, very important. And they are working uh, with that. And the fund of so, who is a, the, the custodian, or, uh, is already mobilizing his people towards that and they are brainstorming on how well to preserve Gonzo for the next 200 years before any worries could come. Thank you. Thank you, Bulami. There is a question from Thomas Fues. What is the position of national authorities in Cameroon towards restitution claims by the Nso people? I think uh, the, it is the responsibility of the, the national governments. In the first place, there is the Ministry of Arts and Culture, which is there to preserve, uh, to, uh, to preserve and perpetuate the, the cultural heritages of, uh, of the, the cultural patrimonies of the country. So the, we are working together, uh, I mean, hand in glove with uh, the, the Ministry of Art and Culture, uh, uh, the Ministry of External Relationship, and the government as a whole, the, the, the president of the Republic uh, equally gave orders and the, there was a cabinet meeting, the cabinet meeting the, of uh, uh, ministerial cabinet meeting of, uh, of, um, uh, of June was preoccupied with this, meaning that there is the conversation about 
the, the restitution is both public and uh, uh, both in the public circles and the civil society circles. So that com uh, the, the partnership between the government and the civil society, as well as the grassroots communities is very alive as far as uh, restitution is concerned. So it is a major, I mean, it's a, it's a topic that is burning in the, in the conversation in society today in, in Cameroon. Um, Ngonso is the very first property to be coming back home. Is there a plan to support other communities in Cameroon um, that, that may want their, their property back from House of CC, from CC House of Fame, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Marie. I think that's a very uh, critical question because also uh, even during the campaign when we had not had the success, we, we were already able to support other communities even out of Cameroon to be able to help them develop strategies for, and I, I, I feel so bad when I talk about strategies because in the real sense of things, we don't need a strategy to bring back things that belong to us. If someone wants to keep things that belong to you, they should rather be developing the strategies. But, you know, we've been out there supporting these communities and it has been amazing because when you get to share experiences with people, they have what they have been through. We have what we have been through. When you put together, you, you put together the lessons learned, you're able to develop a framework that can support other communities. And yes, we are very, very willing to support communities to, we can only share our experiences and add our voices to their campaigns, but we don't have the final decision. And that's something that we are working on right now. In the days ahead, we will be, you know, sending out a form for communities that think that we can work together to support their own restitution claims for them to fill the form. And then we organize workshops and meetings. Like I said, it, 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 the decision will not come from us, the outcome of this, uh, the restitution request, but then, we are willing and as always to support with the different communication strategies we have with research. So if there's anyone out there that is, um, is having in mind that they want to you know, seek the return of objects, please do contact us. We are willing to support and we can always uh, leave a contact an email address in the chat box for anyone who wants to make that request. We're very willing to collaborate with a lot of people, anyone who is willing to collaborate with us as well. Um, Maria mentioned the, the, the return of bronzes in Benin. Um, do you see Sylvie and, uh, and the Bulami um, a collaboration, an international collaboration with, with um, CC House of Fame and other countries to bring back more properties? Yeah, like I mentioned already, um, this is an immediate achievement, but there is a vision. And the vision is Africa, because we believe that if we let this momentum die, we're gonna start a war. I mean, a war as in a war with guns and all the, whatever you could think of in, in a war to be able to have this conversation get back again to where it is today. And so, yes, we, 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 we see a kind of international collaboration. We have reached out already to some people in Benin and also we've reached out to some people already in, in Burkina Faso. And we, are, we, are, we, we think that it is better to work, you know, to unify the effort and to have a common platform of communication as well. It makes it stronger when we are together. Also, sometimes it can be challenging when you have, you know, restitution request, um, just flying around, especially when within the country, the case of Cameroon, we have a lot of uh, restitution requests and there's no connection as such, like they, we don't know each other, we are just going straight forward for what we want. And I admire that passion. But what I honestly think also is that it's time to get together, to make the movement bigger, to be able to achieve a lot of things. And so we, we have that vision to work with different countries, with different communities, and not just with Africa, but also with these communities, with these countries that are keeping the artifacts. Because if we limit it to just working with Africa, we would be working with ourselves. And the plan is always to speak to somebody, speak with the person and not at the person. And so at this point in time, we are very much ready. We've built a, a powerful network also within Germany. And we think that we are in a good place to support other people. And we are also looking at 
you know, working with in other countries as well, I think in, in April, Paris, to just have an overview of what we will have to be dealing with in the days ahead. So we are very ready to, to work uh, with anybody internationally, locally, wherever they may be, we are very ready for that. It is very interesting to know about that. Thank you, Sylvie. There is a question um, for another question for Sylvie from Frederick Port. I hope I've not I've pronounced it well. You were making a distinction between a right-based approach and an evidence-based approach based on your experience with regard, with regard to restitution process of Ngonso. Which approach was more successful? Sorry, I wasn't mute, sorry. I, I think for me, both approaches uh, are very, very important. Approaching it for us, we approached it from a cultural rights perspective, also given the circumstances. These are objects that are very, very important to our spirituality, to our essence, to our culture as a people. And also these objects staying away from us has been a desecration of our culture. And mind you that during the time that these objects were taken, the, our palace was burned down and there is a royal palace. That's something you don't take lightly. So for us, we used the cultural right and the human right approach, as well as the evidence-based approach. Now saying, okay, within, in context, we had these particular uh, military leaders who committed a lot of crimes and we have evidence. And also, I mean, the German contact point for collections and colonial context, they've established this, there's this framework already that is existing. So you have mentioned that you should handle things as a matter of urgency if there is proof that these things were unethically collected. And now we have the evidence that these things were unethically co uh, collected. Therefore, they should be returned. So I think it's very important to balance both approaches, but also the most important part is understanding the conversation from the depth. The depth of this conversation is confronting the colonial past. Restitution is just a key part of this conversation. When you understand the dynamics of the confrontation of the colonial past, you will have other approaches to bring in that are not even necessarily the human or cultural rights approach, nor the, the evidence-based approach. There would be a lot when you understand the depth of the conversation. There are a lot of people wanting to get in touch with um, Sylvia and Bolami. Um, you can find that uh, the information on CC House of Fame's website, which is cchouseoffame.org. We will, we will uh, share that in the chat. Um, Maria, there are still 27 um, properties to return. So who is supposed to, to, to give the go ahead for them to, to, to be, for them to return in Cameroon, to Cameroon, sorry. Hi, I guess you're talking about the objects that are held in the, in the Linden Museum in Egypt. Yes. Um, I think that a first step would be to establish, of course, cooperation uh, and, and a conversation with the museum, which I think that, that Sylvie already did, or she's been, she's been talking with the, with the curator and, and uh, as far as I'm informed, there will also be a conversation with the with the director of, of the museum, uh, um, Ines de Castro, and uh, I would take it from there, so to say, and, and, and develop or decide together the next steps. Uh, in general, uh, I would say a decision to, to to return an object is taken by the by the trustee of the museum which in this case is the cultural ministry and the city of Stuttgart. Uh, it's uh, like a share uh, trust, they are, they are the shared trustees of, of this museum. So a decision is taken by, by these both authorities, but I would say, I mean, if, if, uh, as, as, as long as the conversation move forward and, and the steps are defined, I wouldn't see an issue why a decision wouldn't be taken, uh, and of course, when 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 the trustees take a decision, different authorities in Germany also have to be involved. For example, the Federal Foreign Office, and the Federal Foreign Office, of course, has to uh, 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 contact um, the Cameroonian government, either the embassy or, or the Ministry of Culture directly. So there are different steps, but I think 
or something that's that's very important in this case and very relevant is is uh, a conversation uh, a cooperation with the museum to define the next steps which i think is moving forward there is a there is a question for you maria from um chanceline bucho how can we go about recovering other um, objects of art that are being held in Europe? Maybe meaning not only in Germany, but Europe. Uh, I think that uh, it, it, I would lie if I, if I told you that I know how the process are, processes are developed in countries outside of, of Germany. Um, I'm very well aware of how things were here, um, even though I'm not German, but I've been, I've been working at the contact point and, uh, and, and cultural institutions in Germany for over four years. So I, I'm, I'm very well aware of how, how things work here, but it would be very challenging for me to, to tell you uh, how processes work in France or in Belgium. I know that there are countries in Europe that have been also discussing the topic, like for example, France, obviously, and, and Belgium, and also the Netherlands, uh, have also you know, published guidelines for dealing with this, with this topic. Uh, I have to say, and, and as an anecdote, so to say that I was uh, um, the past two weeks in, in, in Spain and in Portugal, and I was really surprised and shocked that nothing's happening at all. Uh, you visit the ethnological museums and you are, or I was at least shocked at the level of, of no discussion at all, or at least an effort to try to present these subjects in a different way. So I would say even in Europe, the, the level of discussion, I think in academia and at the museum, uh, museum's level and also at the political level is, is very different. Um, and, uh, but I think that um, in Germany, we, um, I mean, we've moved on uh, a lot, I think, and uh, we've moved forward, so to say, especially over the past two years or, or, or three years since, since the framework principles were agreed on and the contact point was created. So uh, that as an overview, but as I say, it, it's very difficult for me to, to give information, to provide information on how processes are, are developed in, in other European countries. But is there, is there, um, is there um, an initiative for the German contact point to share its experience with other countries in Europe? Uh, there has been communication, for example, with, with France, uh, with different um, colleagues in France. Uh, we are now in touch, for example, with ICOM, um, with the International Council from, uh, of Monuments, of Museums, in, in sorry, of Museums in, 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 in France. Um, so the, the French office, so to say, to exchange our, our views and our experience. But uh, I must say that, that uh, a constant or permanent exchange between European countries, at least at the level of, of at the working level, has not taken place. Uh, I think that at the governmental level, it might have taken place. Um, I cannot say for sure, um, but at least for us, um, I think that's something that we need to, we would need to focus on. Uh, maybe in the in the first two years, we were focusing on on solving, you know. Um, uh, organizing our house, so to say, um, so that we could, you know, establish, you know, a cooperation or, or a contact with other European countries and, and see uh, how we can support them or how they can support us in, in this process. Thank you, Maria. There is a question for Sylvie and um, Bulami. Um, what is next when it comes to restitution for Cameroon? Um, all right. I mean, I would answer that question uh, from the perspective of what is next in context with the return of Gonzo. Um, return of Gonzo and then the, the, the 27 right. other, other... And the 27 other objects. All right. Thank you. Um, so it's important to, again, emphasize on the fact that we have uh, a lot of royal objects that are left behind at this point in time with the Linden Museum. And as Maria already said, we are in contact with the museum and we are hoping in the next days to, again, find a solution. We always talk about solutions. So to find a solution to this conversation we are having. And for us, it's important for these objects to come back together because they played, as I mentioned already, a complementary role. So right now what we are doing is we are, we, we are entering conversations with the museum, the Linden Museum, while continuing with 
the negotiation plans with the SPK. And this is very important because um, Gonzo already crossed borders. So it becomes, you know, an international relations kind of thing. It becomes a state to state relations kind of, of thing. And at this point in time, internally as Cameroon, we are already putting ourselves together as a team to be able to meet the German team to have these negotiations and then the handover and the return. And it, it entails a lot internally. It entails a lot bringing together the different ministries, then sort of people working out their, mapping out their strategy and way forward, and then collaborating with the state stakeholders before the make a team to now face the German state stakeholders. In, in line with other cases, and I must mention again to emphasize that um, the return of Ngonso is the first case of restitution the Cameroon government is going to be handling in context with, when we talk about context of colonial collections, colonial loot, it is the first. We've had others, like someone mentioned, we've had the return of a Fuacom, but the context is totally different. This is the first in the, in the context of colonialism. And so it's a learning process for everybody. We are still learning, the, the, the government is still learning. We are testing um, solutions, different solutions to different things. And where they don't work, we fall back and see how to build better. So in the days ahead, I think once we successfully have the return of Gonzo and hopefully the other objects, the royal objects at the Linden Museum, I think this would be, a, a, it would put Cameroon in a better position to develop a framework for restitution of other cases. But then again, I must mention that there are other pending restitution cases. For example, the people of Bangwa, they're asking for, uh, for their objects. We have the people of Banyo, we have the people of Tibati, the Lok Prisa of Douala. And it's important for people to understand that at this point in time, anything can happen. There is even a possibility that all of these objects would come back at the same time with Gonzo. But then what should be known is that there is work being done both behind the curtains and in the public to ensure that the conversation of the restitution doesn't end with Ngonso, that other objects being demanded by communities that are also brought back, especially objects collected in colonial context. And I think the Cameroon government is also in, in very good conversations already with, with the German state stakeholders. And I think it's going to really go easy from, from now on. It might not be as easy as we want, but then it's going to go better from now on. How do you see the role of um, open society in the restitution of the properties, um, especially the, the 27 um, other prop properties that should, that, that should um, go back to Cameroon? Um, that's for me, correct? Yes, that's for you. Okay. For you and Bula, right. maybe. Okay. <laughs> um, so when we, when we talk about the return, I think open society has played a very key role in and you know, in, in enhancing rest, the restitution process in supporting communities. And I think the state as well, different states to be able to enhance the conversation. Because first of all, it's, it's about having decent conversations to set the framework for different things to happen, to set the ball rolling for different things to happen. And as an activist and um, a founder of an organization also working on, 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 on in a colonial context, I think that open society has a key role to play in, in mobilizing resources. They have the potential to mobilize resources. I think they also have the potential to mobilize communities, to support communities that are seeking restitution. And I think one key thing that I would wish very much from open society is also to document best practices, to share with other communities, is also to, to, to let communities exchange knowledge let communities build better together and to support the restitution process in whatever way they can. I think they play this pivotal role also in that they have it as a key priority, but also they are not the government, neither are they the communities. So they are very much better placed to support all the stakeholders involved. And I think that this is something I encourage other organizations to also contribute to in supporting the conversation of a restitution and ensuring that we don't just have conversations, but that in the end, these things are happening. 
Thank you so much, Sylvie, Maria, uh, uh, and Bulami. Yes, oh, yeah. Bulami. I don't Sorry. know if I could uh, add a word to what uh, CV just said. You definitely can. Okay. Uh, I think um, we can equally help uh, Open Society Foundation by telling our story to them, telling the genuine story to them of how it happened. Every community has to, if you need help, tell the truth about what you know happened to you, and that will ease the work of the Open Society uh, Foundation. And that is exactly what uh, the, uh, CC and I are here to let the Open Society understand the relevance of those objects as far as the so, uh, uh, traditional and cultural life uh, uh, lives are concerned. So, if they, if they, or if everybody opens up to uh, to to open society foundation, I think it will ease their the the intention. And as CC has already said, there is a lot of potential in a, in a seems, open foundation, seems. open society foundation for them to come to the assistance of any community. Thank you so much Thank you. for this. Thank you. Thank you for the precision. Um, thank you to Maria, Sylvie, and Bulami. Uh, for all those who want to continue the discussion, you can reach out to CC House of Fame on their website, cchouseoffame.org. We put it on the, in the chat. Um, it was a pleasure to have our panelists with, with us today, and it was a pleasure to have our audience as well. Thank you. I wish you all a pleasant afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Anne Marie. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Okay.